This is Audible. Hello and welcome to Recording One of the Princeton Review WordSmart 2 Vocabulary Building Program. By the time you finish this course, you'll be well acquainted with over 200 words, important words, useful words, powerful words that will make you a better speaker, a keener reader, and a more expressive writer. Here's how the system works. We've called the words from the Princeton Review WordSmart and WordSmart 2 vocabulary books and placed them into topic groups. You'll find it easier to learn new words in the context of a larger group of related words than it is to memorize an arbitrary list. Furthermore, groups of words with similar meanings often share the same roots, suffixes, and prefixes. These basic building blocks show up again and again, and by learning the kinds of words in which they appear, you'll familiarize yourself with those building blocks. Then you'll be able to crack open the meanings of countless numbers of words. Each group of words is broken down into two complementary parts. For example, the first group is called the raw and the cooked. We'll examine each half individually and then review the group as a whole and mix things up a bit. Along with the words, their definitions and examples, we'll also include speeches and stories. There's a lot to cover and it all occurs in rather quick succession. But remember, this is your course to listen to at your speed. So, whenever you need to stop or repeat a section, then by all means go ahead and do it, as often or as little as you like. We're certainly not going anywhere. Indeed, we are not. And now we're ready to commence. Let the cavalcade of words begin. Our first group is, as we mentioned, the raw and the cooked. So we'll be dealing with words that connote things that are very young, or only very slightly formed, the raw and things that have been around for a long time, the cooked. We'll cover the first half, well, first. We're all benighted in this group, so maybe we should take it kind of slow for now. The cleverness begins apace, I see. Benighted is our first word, and you've used it in context to get us started. We are, in fact, benighted because benighted means unenlightened, ignorant or intellectually in the dark. Not one of Mr. Emerson's benighted students could say with certainty in which century the Second World War had occurred. Benighted is one of those words that comes complete with an easy way to remember it. We call these mnemonic devices. A mnemonic device is the mental equivalent of tying a string around your finger in order to remember to do something. Since you'll be learning so many words, mnemonic devices will really help you remember the tough ones. Now, there are absolutely no rules about these. Your mnemonics can be based on the roots of the words, their spellings, the way they sound, or even other things that may remind you of the word. For example, I learned to remember the word somnolescent because its root, somna, reminds me of the word insomnia, which means an inability to sleep. Somnolescent means something that makes you go to sleep, so it's easy to make the connection, and that's a mnemonic device. Benighted is easy to remember because it sounds like what it means, in the dark. Not literally, but intellectually. You can hear the word night in there, so it's easy to recall the meaning of the word. Next up is neophyte. The prefix neo means new, recent, or recently revived. A neophyte is someone who is new at something, or a novice. I'm not being fussy, I just don't like having brain surgery performed by a neophyte. I'd simply prefer a doctor with some experience. When it comes to love, Mitchell is a neophyte. Without any previous experience, he's bound to mess things up at first. The prefix neo is a part of a lot of different words, such as neologism, which means a new word, and neonate, which means newborn. Neo often gets attached to the beginning of words by a hyphen to change or adjust the meaning of the word. For example, neoconservative, neo-feudalist, Neo, dog lover, etc. All of these are used to describe a kind of person who is reviving a style or movement that doesn't exist anymore in its original form. When something is very young or very new to the point of being only partially formed, it's embryonic. This is another easy one to remember because it gets its meaning from a word that we all know and understand, embryo, which is any unborn plant or animal that is still in the earliest stages of development. The word doesn't have to be used only to describe an organism, though. It has much broader possibilities beyond that. For example, the plans for the new building are, at this point, embryonic. In fact, they consist of a little sketch on the back of a cocktail napkin. 
Your plans to paint the streets of the town to look like the yellow brick road are past the embryonic stage, but you still have to get started. It's important to note that when something is embryonic, it is still unformed. When someone is callow, however, they are fully formed physically, only immature. Callow means youthfully naive, inexperienced, and unsophisticated. The patient was alarmed by the callow Dr. Hauser. He looked too young to have graduated from high school, much less medical school. Often it's when someone tries hardest not to appear callow that their callowness is most apparent. Driving fast cars, smoking filterless cigarettes, and skipping class are all callow pursuits, despite what the people doing it might think. Sticking with the raw theme of this first group, let's look at impromptu, which means done without preparation or on the spur of the moment. Peter had hoped that we would think the meal was impromptu, but everyone knows that souffle, matzo balls, and duck à l'orange take hours of preparation. Since we were stuck in the woods without supplies and were anxious to avoid the deadly bolts of lightning, we pulled together an impromptu shelter of branches, leaves, and paper from our notebooks. An impromptu story about why you didn't show up until 3.30 in the morning might be called a lie. But only if it wasn't true. Now, progeny is anything that represents offspring or descendants. This can apply to people, places, or things. Mr. Snatch is rich in nothing but progeny. He says he'd rather have a million children than a million dollars. And if progeny is the word for the offspring, then the word for the parent or creator of that offspring is progenitor. Both words contain the root gen, spelled G-E-N, which often refers to creation or birth or beginnings, as in genesis, engender, or even simply gene. Next on the list is overture, which most people know as the music that happens at the beginning of a concert or show. That is in fact one of its meanings, but it can also mean the first move or opening offer, often with romantic undertones. For example, during the overture to West Side Story, Izzy, who wanted desperately to mate with Suki, made several overtures to her. She rebuffed those overtures, and as a result, no new baboons were born. An overture need not necessarily be romantic, however. Any opening move can be described as such. At contract time, for instance, management's overture to the union was rejected out of hand. They wanted much higher wages. Another way to get things started is to inaugurate them. The president begins his term with an inauguration. Anything that is given an official start can be inaugurated. The new scout program was inaugurated on Saturday at the treatment plant. I'd like to inaugurate the next example, if I may. And you may. Why, thank you. Here it is, then. I give you fledgling. Fledgling means young, inexperienced, or immature. A baby bird is always called a fledgling until it's able to fly. Then it is said to be fledged. Lucy was still a fledgling caterer when her deviled eggs gave the whole party food poisoning. Full-fledged means complete or full-grown. Now that Lucy is a full-fledged gourmet chef, her eggs are the toast of the town. Fledgling marks the end of the first half of our first group, the raw and the cooked. Before we move on to the second half and cover those words that cover the cooked, let's review the words we just talked about in short order. Here they are. Neophyte. A beginner or novice. Fledgling. Inexperienced or immature. Benighted. Ignorant or unenlightened. Inaugurate. To begin officially or to induct into office. Overture. An opening move or preliminary offer. Impromptu. Done without preparation, on the spur of the moment. Embryonic. Undeveloped or rudimentary. Callow. Immature and unsophisticated. Progeny. Offspring. Children. Now, for the key ingredient in our Word Smart recipe. We're going to add a person to the mix. A person who will use the raw words in context so you can really get a feel for how they work. After all, if the words never get off this tape and into the mouths of real people in the real world, then I ask you, what's the use? Let's listen, then, to child psychologist Abigail Throbegin. Yes, well, I've discovered that few interactions are as poignant as those between youngsters attempting to start romantic relationships for the first time. 
the opening move is usually made by the young male. Typically, such an overture involves the giving of a gift. The official start of the relationship, the inauguration, if you will, can be said to occur when the young female accepts that gift. These moments are rarely impromptu and are often planned days in advance. Even after she accepts the gift, be it flowers, candy, or even a cigarette, the relationship is still considered to be in its embryonic stage, that is, still largely undeveloped, until she offers a gift of her own. More sophisticated, less callow lovers, of course, often devise more complicated schemes to ensnare a mate. However, few moments are as fresh, simple, and joyous as the one in which a young romance transforms itself into a full-fledged love affair. And few individuals are as full of hope and, shall we say, energy, as a neophyte lover who is experiencing another person on an intimate level for the very first time. Some might argue that no one else is more in the dark, for such a benighted young person can have no knowledge of the pain that awaits them at the moment of their love's demise. Oh well, they'll learn. And if you think that's something, you should see how parents react when they see their progeny behaving just the way they used to. Well, that covers the raw words. We'll revisit these words again during the review at the end of the section. For now, though, let's hit some words from the cooked half of the group. Now, these words don't necessarily represent things that have been cooked in an oven, only things that have been around for a while and are not, well, raw, so to speak. In other words, permit the metaphorical nature of our category names, won't you? I will. But do, let's get started. We'll pull no punches with our first word. It's a goodie. Antiquity, which means ancientness or having to do with ancient times. The slow speed at which Rudy was driving was not surprising, considering the antiquity of his car. It was made in 1904. Layla adored studying ancient history. She's always had a love of antiquity. Overpriced chairs and other furniture from the olden days are antiques. Objects or ideas that are too old-fashioned to be of use are called antiquated. Someone who studies antiquity is called an antiquary. Get the idea? When something is really showing its age, when it's gray or white from too many years, when it's hard or stale from sitting around too long, it's called hoary. Hoary? Doesn't that mean whore-like? Get your mind out of the gutter, woman. No, it doesn't. You may have heard the term hoary chestnut. That means an old joke or idea that's no longer current or funny. Or how about the dog's hoary muzzle and cloudy eyes clearly indicate her advanced years? The notion that a woman's place is in the home is a hoary idea. Few people still think it holds true. And they are usually pretty hoary themselves. Don't confuse hoary with trite, which means overused. Hoary means old in a crusty or stale sort of way. A hoary joke, like, why did the chicken cross the road, antedates more current jokes about NASA's failures by about a hundred years. Antedate means to be older than or to have come before. Ballet antedates breakdancing by at least a century, even though dancers continue to be a fussy and self-absorbed group. The root ante, spelled A-N-T-E, means before or in front of, and is often part of words that mean old. Antediluvian, for example, means incredibly old. Ante means before, and diluvian means flood, as in the flood, the big one, the one that Noah survived. So antediluvian means literally before the flood, or in other words, really super old. Shakespeare's plays may not be antediluvian, but they do antedate those of Neil Simon by nearly 400 years. You can imagine whose plays are still going to be around 400 years from now, when Shakespeare will still antedate Neil Simon by several centuries. But who can say what the next millennium will hold for us, fast approaching as it is? A millennium is a period of a thousand years. We're living in the 1900s, or the end of the second millennium. The new millennium approaches, you know, and I want to get good seats. That's only a few years away, so I'd better start shopping now. I want to look good for posterity. Posterity. Posterity means future generations, descendants, and the world in which they'll be living. 
Dina is saving her diaries for posterity. She hopes her kids and grandkids will enjoy them. I wear army boots with lace lingerie so that posterity will remember me as unique. Posterity will ask the question, who was the coolest one of all? And I want the answer to be me. You may think you look different, but the fact is that outfit is just part of a larger continuum of loopy ensembles. A continuum is anything that is a continuous whole without any clear divisions into parts. The spectrum of visible light is a continuum in which each color blends into its neighbors. The next cooked word is incumbent, which means currently holding office. The incumbent dog warden would love to surrender his job to someone else, but no one else is running for the job. Those were adjectival versions of the word. Here it is as a noun. In a political race, the incumbent is the candidate who already holds office. Incumbent also has a secondary meaning, which means something like obligatory. In that case, it's generally followed by the preposition upon. For example, it is incumbent upon you as my love slave to make me feel good all the time. Ah, and it's incumbent upon you as a person striving for sanity to wake up and get a grip. Incumbent. I think we'd better quickly move along and cover the final word in this group. Aboriginal. This is another word with two meanings. First, native, and second, dating back to the very beginning. The Aborigines of Australia are the earliest known human inhabitants of Australia. While working on the subway tunnel, we discovered pottery and netting from the island's Aboriginal inhabitants. Okay, time for a quick review of the words from the second half of the group, the raw and the cooked after which we'll hear from a soul who can really breathe some life into these words. Here are the words. Continuum. A continuous whole without clear division into parts. Antidate. To be older than, to have come before. Antiquity. Ancient times. Aboriginal. Native or dating back to the very beginning. Millennium. A period of a thousand years or a thousandth anniversary. Incumbent. Currently holding office or obligatory. Posterity. The future and future generations. Hoary. Stale, gray or white with age. Great. It's people time again, folks. Time to hear how these words work when used in everyday speech, where, after all, they matter most. Listen to them, memorize them, use them. Here, then, is Master Chef Mackie Baudelaire. Hello, hello, welcome to Chez Mackie Baudelaire, your home away from home. Tonight we celebrate the oldest foods from my native land, aboriginal delicacies which entertain even such classics as the French fry and the Catherine de Neuve. We shall look back, my friends, way, way back into antiquity tonight to find our recipes. As the year 2000 approaches and we are prepared to celebrate the new millennium, we must take stock of what has come before. And few things bind us to our past and illustrate the grand flow of history quite like well-prepared food. Food erases the arbitrary divisions of historical eras to reveal the true continuum of life. What's more? future generations will want to know what we ourselves were like and I say to them look to our food let posterity know that we were at least good eaters oops I see that you have spilled your salt we must throw a pinch over your shoulder to ward off bad luck do it do it perhaps you think that hoary superstition is outdated but here at Chez Mackie Baudelaire we joke not with fate it is incumbent upon me your host to make sure that you remain safe and happy, no? Otherwise, some other upstart will want my job and I plan to be the incumbent for a long time to come. Now, may I suggest a nice red wine with your dinner? All right, enough talk. Now we're going to review all of the words from the group, the raw and the cooked. This time, however, we're going to mix them up. You'll hear a word after which there will be a short pause. That's your chance to think about the meaning, or at least which group it belongs in. Then you'll hear the sentence in which the word appeared during the speech, and finally, a definition will be given. Word, 
pause, sentence, definition. That's how it goes. Ready, set, go. Neophyte. Few individuals are as full of hope and, shall we say, energy as a neophyte lover, experiencing another person on an intimate level for the very first time. A neophyte is a beginner. Despite my love of the game, as a neophyte, I lost my first game of tennis in straight sets. Antiquity. We shall look back, my friends, way, way back into antiquity to find our recipes. Antiquity is ancient times or ancientness. One day, thousands of years from now, we'll be viewed as part of antiquity. Millennium. As the year 2000 approaches and we prepare to celebrate the new millennium, we must take stock of what has come before. A millennium is a period of a thousand years or a thousandth anniversary. The year 3000 is a millennium away, plus a few years. Fledgling. Few moments are as fresh, simple, and joyous as the one in which a young romance transforms itself into a full-fledged love affair. Fledgling means inexperienced or very young. A fledgling bird can't fly because its wings are still too small. Hoary. Perhaps you think that hoary superstition is outdated, but here at Shea Mackey Baudelaire, we joke not with fate. When something is hoary, it's old and stale, outdated. A couple that stays married for their whole lives is a hoary notion in many circles. Overture. The opening move is usually made by the young male. Typically, such an overture involves the giving of a gift. An overture is an opening move or preliminary offer. The promise of a lifetime supply of chocolate is an alluring overture. Antidate. Tonight, we celebrate the oldest foods from my native land. Aboriginal delicacies which antedate even such classics as the French fry and Catherine Deneuve. Antedate means to be older than, to come before. Word Smart 1 antedates Word Smart 2 by a year. Embryonic. Even after she accepts the gift, be it flowers, candy, or even a cigarette, the relationship is still considered to be in its embryonic stage, that is, still largely undeveloped. Something that is embryonic is like an embryo, unformed. My plan to sell the Statue of Liberty as scrap metal is still embryonic. I just thought of it today, and I haven't worked out all the details. Impromptu. These moments are rarely impromptu and are often planned days in advance. Impromptu means unplanned, done on the spur of the moment. An impromptu dinner for 400 guests is not a great idea. Planning is needed. Progeny. And if you think that's something, you should see how parents react when they see their progeny behaving just the way they used to. Progeny means offspring or children, and it can be used either literally or figuratively. According to most religions, we are all God's progeny. Posterity. Let posterity know that we were at least good eaters. Posterity means future generations. Posterity will thank us for preserving the environment today. Benighted. Some might argue that no other is more in the dark, for such a benighted young person can have no knowledge of the pain that awaits them at the moment of their love's demise. Benighted means intellectually in the dark, without a lot of knowledge. Before I learned the hard way, I was benighted regarding proper use of the bandsaw. Inaugurate. The official start of the relationship, the inauguration, if you will, can be said to occur when the young female accepts that gift. To inaugurate is to start officially or to install into office. After the president was inaugurated, we went to the inaugural ball. Continuum. Food erases the arbitrary divisions of historical eras to reveal the true continuum of life. A continuum is a continuous whole with no clear divisions. Life itself is often referred to as a continuum that never stops or ends. 
callow. More sophisticated, less callow lovers, of course, often devise more complicated schemes to ensnare a mate. Callow means unsophisticated or immature. Drinking too much cheap beer and then throwing up in the hallway is callow behavior. Aboriginal. Tonight we celebrate the oldest foods from my native land. Aboriginal delicacies which antedate even such classics as the French fry and Catherine Deneuve. Aboriginal means dating back to the beginning of a place, native. My family has been in this town since people first lived here. We are Aboriginal people. Incumbent. Otherwise, some other upstart will want my job, and I plan to be the incumbent for a long time to come. Now, may I suggest a nice red wine with your dinner? Incumbent means already in office, or sometimes obligatory. Until she steps down, Sheriff Marcy is the incumbent chief of the police. Well, that pretty much takes care of our first group, the raw and the cooked. Feel free to go back and listen again if you like, and be certain to have a look at the insert card in the cassette package to see how the words are spelled. Memorizing the spelling not only helps you spell them correctly, but it can also help you remember the words' meanings. Spelling often reveals the roots or prefixes that can function as good mnemonic devices. And now, without further ado, we're going to move on to the next group of words: stop and go. Once again, we're going to cut the group in half. We'll start by talking about those words which fall under the heading of stop. We'll define them, drill them, and then listen to them used in context. After that's all done, we'll move on to the go words. Ready? Ready. Set. Set. Go. No, stop. I thought you said you were ready. I am. So why stop? Because you said go. What? We're supposed to be doing stop. I know. But you said go. Look, pal, don't mess with me. I'm not. You said go when you meant stop. But if we stop, then we'll never go. Right. Right. So go. Stop. Yes. Oh. Oh what? Why didn't you just say that? What? Go. That's what I said. Okay. So go. Okay. Okay. Here's the first of the words from the stop half of the group. Sedentary. When people get older, they tend to become more sedentary. They spend a lot of time just sitting still. Sedentary means not physically active, largely confined to sitting down in one place. If you want to stay in shape with that sedentary job, you'll have to get a lot of exercise in your spare time. An impasse is a deadlock, a situation from which there is no escape. After arguing all day, the jury was forced to admit that they had reached an impasse. They realized they could never agree. You say potato, and I say potato. Neither of us is willing to compromise, so it seems we've reached an impasse. Either you agree to say potato, or nothing will ever change. Remy and Martin hit an impasse when they drove their Chevy to the levee, only to find a dead end and no way to turn around. I suggest that we don't malinger here on the word impasse much longer. And in so suggesting, as you might be able to tell, I have cleverly found a way to introduce yet another stop word: malinger. Yes, you have. You have found a way to do just that. And malinger means, rather specifically, to hang around for no good reason other than to avoid doing something, often by dint of the excuse that one is sick. Rachel, for example, always malingered when it was her turn to do the housework. She sat on the sofa, claiming to have the gout. Malinger is a lot like loiter, only loiter lacks the connotation of sickness. Loiter is a little bit sinister, whereas malinger implies laziness and lack of enthusiasm, masked as illness. To fetter, you know, means to restrain or to hamper. In a literal sense, a fetter is a chain attached to a person's foot, usually a criminal, designed to restrain them. A person can be fettered in a spiritual way as well as physically. While the cement shoes that Don was wearing were designed to fetter his attempts to swim to the surface, his last-minute confession unfettered his soul as it headed for heaven. Moving on, supine means lying on one's back. For example, when Rachel broke her pelvis, she was forced to lay supine for several months. Nikki lay supine in her deck chair, drink in hand, face to the sun, skin turning into leather. The opposite of supine, which would be lying on one's stomach, by the way, is called prone. Supine can also be used to describe a person who barely ever moves. 
Here's a word that's a bit of a stretch, but I think is worth including on our little tape. Reactionary. This is a word that is often misused and misunderstood. It means ultra-conservative, right-wing, or backward thinking. Uncle Snodgrass is so reactionary that he thinks women shouldn't be allowed to vote. Reactionary can also function as a noun. Lester is a reactionary on the subject of privacy. He thinks everybody's private business should be kept on record for use by the government. Essentially, reactionaries are opposed to any forward movement away from the status quo and towards a more liberal way of thinking or behaving. Stop. Clear your brain of all thoughts and activity. Let your mind become quiescent. Only when your mind is still will you be able to appreciate my charms. When something is quiescent, as I'm glad to see your mind has in fact become, it is still, at rest, motionless. The party started out as a real hoedown, but after the host insisted on playing his harpsichord composition a dozen times, things grew quiescent. It sounds almost like quiet, and the meaning can be inferred from that. True enough. When things are quiescent, they are often quiet as well. After a week at the ashram and all those deep massages, both my soul and my body were in a state of quiescence. I don't mind sailing as long as the seas remain quiescent, but the moment the waters become rough, I start to vomit. Lovely! Okay. Let's wrap up this half of the group with the last word. Q. Spelled Q-U-E-U-E. -E. It's a rather British word for line. In London, they don't stand in line, they queue up. If you use a computer, you might be familiar with this queue. Files that are in the computer waiting to be printed are said to be in a queue. As you can see, queue can be a noun or a verb. If you're going to queue up for tickets to the film festival, you can expect to wait in an awfully long queue. Now we're queued up for the quick drill which follows a group of words and precedes a story from a real person who will use those words in context. So without further delay, once again, here are the words from the stop half of the group, Stop and Go. Sedentary. Sedentary means not physically active, largely confined to staying in one place. Impasse. An impasse is a deadlock, a situation from which there is no escape. Malinger. Malinger means to hang around so as not to do something. Often being unable is the excuse. Fetter. To fetter is to restrain, hamper, or hinder. Supine. Supine means lying on one's back. Reactionary. Reactionary means ultra-conservative, right-wing, or backwards thinking. Quiescent. Something quiescent is still, at rest, motionless. Q. A Q is another word for line or file. Now for the fun part. It's time to hear from a real-life person who's going to make all these words come alive for us. Here to get us started, then, is Dorothea Silver of the Department of Motor Vehicles. Well, let's see. I've been processing driver's licenses for close to, well, nearly 25 years now. It seems like it would be a sedentary job, but let me tell you, I've had to be quick on my feet. Things go quickly from quiescent to chaotic. Most people are not in a great mood by the time they reach my window. The queue usually snakes around all the way out the door by nine in the morning. After waiting in line for hours, many folks are told that they're in the wrong line, much to their chagrin. Unfettered by the rules of common courtesy, they frequently vent their rage on little old me. Once, an angry young man who failed his vision test and had his license revoked waited for me after work and punched me out, knocking me supine on the sidewalk. Being more of a progressive liberal than a reactionary who believes in the old eye-for-an-eye eye routine, I decided not to press charges. But now I'm regretting it because he keeps taking sick days malingering in the motor vehicle department lobby. I've tried to reason with him... But we seem to have reached an impasse. I still won't give him a driver's license until he gets glasses. He refuses to get off his butt and visit the eye doctor. Oh, well, at least he's no longer on the road behind the wheel. Welcome back. We were, I believe, in the middle of the group Stop and Go, were we not? We had covered all the words in the Stop group, and now it's on to those in the second half. 
go. We'll begin with expedite, which means to speed up or ease the process of something, to help get things done. A lawyer from a better firm helped to expedite the divorce process. Now we're getting somewhere. Waiting patiently is no way to get a table at Chez Mackey Baudelaire. You have to expedite things by slipping the maitre d' a little something on the side. The march of time is relentless. Nothing but nothing can stop it. We'll all get old and we'll all die. Time will not relent. To relent, of course, means to stop or give up. So relent less, it's no surprise, means the opposite, something that does not stop. The rabbit's appetite was relentless. It ate and ate until its little body was blown up like a furry balloon. Then it exploded. We must now relent and move on to another word. If we dwell too long in one place, we might lose our momentum. And once we stop, we'll never get started again. Momentum is the force of movement, speed, or impetus. The golf cart started down the hill at a decent speed, but it gained momentum as it continued. When your glider lost momentum and came crashing to the ground, it caused your flying career to lose momentum as well. But the trauma galvanized your spirit and helped you finish your long overdue PhD thesis. To galvanize is to startle into sudden activity, to revitalize. A good coach should be able to galvanize the team, even on the worst day of the most dismal season when the players are facing the toughest team in the league. My recent descent into hell galvanized me into trying to be a better person. Well, I don't suppose hell is the type of place to which one should emigrate. Antoine emigrated from France to England because the sound of French made his head spin like a top. Now he's a French emigre. Whenever someone emigrates from one place, like France, they are considered immigrants in another, like England. So in London, Antoine was just one of many French immigrants seeking fame and fortune. When sanctions were placed on the war-happy nation-state, many of its people decided to emigrate to neighboring and peace-loving countries. Ah, now you've gone and done something interesting. Riddle me this, Batman. Who sanctioned those sanctions? What? Who sanctioned those sanctions? You use the noun version of the word sanction, which means a penalty of some sort, usually a stoppage of exports to a place. But strangely enough, the verb form of the word sanction means very nearly the opposite. To sanction means to offer official endorsement or approval or to give permission. George, the genetic engineer, for example, sanctioned the propagation of a new species of cocktail roaches designed specifically to eat green olives and gimlet onions. Ah, there's a good word, propagation, which means the act of reproducing, spreading, or multiplying. The Alliance of Processed Sugar Lovers, or APSL, is dedicated to propagating the theory that processed sugar is incredibly good for you. Meanwhile, we're at the last word in the go half of the group stop and go. And the word is... A lovely word that sounds a little like what it means. Evanescent. Example first. Shooting stars are evanescent. They last so briefly that it's hard to tell whether or not they actually appeared. Evanescent means fleeting, happening for only the briefest period of time, quickly vanishing. Marty's victory was evanescent. Only minutes after winning the election, he was arrested on charges of extortion. Ah, but such is life. One never knows what one had until it's gone. Hmm, like this upcoming quick review. It, too, will be evanescent, I think. It will end before it's barely begun. But here it is, nonetheless, a drill of the go-words. Galvanize. To spur or startle into sudden activity, to revitalize. Sanction. To give official permission to, to endorse or encourage. Emigrate. To leave one country or place for another, to expatriate. Evanescent. Fleeting. Appearing and disappearing quickly. Not long-lasting. Expedite. To ease or speed up a process. To help get something done. Relentless. Unstoppable or continuous. Never-ending. Momentum. The force of movement. Speed or the gaining of speed or energy. Propagate. To spread, reproduce, multiply, or cause to grow. Now I'm pleased to introduce a certain someone who will personify these words and bring them to life, make them sing. Ladies and gents, here to present the Go Words is Captain Paul Ballard, earnest airline pilot and sometime lounge performer. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Lucky Airlines Flight 362 from here to eternity. We've just left the ground and are gaining momentum. Soon we'll be going pretty fast. We recommend that you buckle up because we're headed towards some rough weather and it looks like it will be relentless. It won't stop too soon, I can tell you that. I understand we have some passengers who are emigrating from Spain tonight. Well, let me just say, hola, and what a pleasure it is to help you make that big move. At this time, I'd like to sanction smoking. Go ahead, light up, all you addicts. Our lovely in-flight comfort managers will begin serving delicious refreshments. Our air hosts will also come in handy should we experience any catastrophic failures of the engines. It's their job to galvanize you all into making a quick exit. They'll also make things easier by expediting the process of getting those finicky emergency doors open. Not to worry, though. Most air disasters are by nature evanescent. They're over in the blink of an eye. Those rumors that people have been propagating about smoke filling the cabin before anyone has a chance to get out are pure myth. I encourage you to just sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. Well, that was really nice, and it brings us to the end of the group Stop and Go. Now it's time to review all of the words from both halves of the group. Sedentary. It seems like it would be a sedentary job, but let me tell you I've had to be quick on my feet. Sedentary means not physically active, largely confined to staying in one place. The sloth is a sedentary animal. It stays in one place for days at a time, and when it does move, it moves slowly. Momentum. We've just left the ground and are gaining momentum. Soon we'll be going pretty fast. Momentum is the force of movement, speed or the gaining of speed or energy. Once your sled starts gaining momentum, it won't slow down until you hit that ditch. Impasse. I've tried to reason with him, but we seem to have reached an impasse. An impasse is a deadlock or a situation from which one can't escape. After the brilliant escape artist managed to get free of the shackles and chains, he found himself at an impasse when he couldn't unzip his fly. Malinger. He keeps taking sick days malingering in the motor vehicle department lobby. Malinger means to hang around so as not to do something, sickness being the typical excuse. The executioner didn't want to chop off any heads, so he malingered in the dungeon office for hours, complaining of fatigue. Expedite. They'll also make things easier by expediting the process of getting those finicky emergency doors open. Expedite. To ease or speed up a process. To help get something done. In order to expedite the sale of his company's stocks, the manager told his clients that the market was about to crash. Fetter and unfetter. Unfettered by the rules of common courtesy, they frequently vent their rage on little old me. Unfetter means free, unrestrained. To fetter is to restrain, hamper, or hinder, to make things more difficult. The parachute was supposed to fetter your descent, but I see by your legs that it didn't quite work out. Propagate. Those rumors that people have been propagating about smoke filling the cabin before anyone has a chance to get out are pure myth. To propagate is to spread, reproduce, multiply, or help to grow in number. The idea that we need to preserve what's left of our environment is being propagated around the world. Supine. He waited for me and punched me out, knocking me supine on the sidewalk. Supine means lying on one's back. My idea of a great day is going to the beach, sipping iced tea, and lying supine under the sun for hours on end. Reactionary. Being more of a progressive liberal than a reactionary who believes in the old eye for an eye routine, I decided not to press charges. Reactionary means ultra-conservative, right-wing or backwards thinking. The reactionary congressman argues that we should attack the former Soviet Union now, while they're at their weakest. Galvanize. It's their job to galvanize you all into making a quick exit. 
To galvanize is to spur or startle into sudden activity, to revitalize. The tenth attack of killer bees was finally enough to galvanize the community into purchasing a truckload of insect repellent. Quiescent. Things quickly go from quiescent to chaotic. Something quiescent is still at rest, motionless. The yacht race was dreadfully dull because both the seas and the wind were utterly quiescent. Sanction. At this time, I'd like to sanction smoking. Go ahead. Light up, you addicts. To sanction is to give official permission to, to endorse or encourage. My boss sanctioned an overhaul of last week's payroll, and none of us was too happy about it. Q. The Q usually snakes around all the way out the door by nine in the morning. A Q is another word for line or file. The nuns were strict about students having to queue up in the morning before class, and woe betide the one who wasn't in the queue by the time the bell rang. Emigrate. I understand we have some passengers who are emigrating from Spain tonight. Well, let me just say hola, and what a pleasure it is to help you make that big move. To emigrate is to leave one country or place for another, to expatriate. Unhappy with life in Bora Bora, Julie emigrated to Walla Walla, where she blissfully lived out the rest of her life. Evanescent. Not to worry, though. Most air disasters are by nature evanescent. They're over in the blink of an eye. Evanescent means fleeting, appearing and disappearing quickly, not long-lasting. Mona's smile was evanescent. She wasn't amused by Leonardo for long. Relentless. We'd recommend that you buckle up because we're headed towards some rough weather, and it looks like it will be relentless. It won't stop too soon, I can tell you that. Something relentless is unstoppable or continuous, never-ending. Despite the public's almost universal disdain for his work and his dreadful performances at the box office, Bud Nelson remains relentless in his pursuit of new movie roles. I don't think he'll ever give up. And that brings us to the end of Stop and Go. Okay. Now, let's get started with the next group of words, which is called crime and punishment. Let's not fight nature by going out of order. We'll begin at the beginning with crime. Lots of police shows on television refer to criminals as perps. This is police shorthand for our first word, perpetrator. The perpetrator is someone who committed the act, usually a crime. The critic found Zoe's singing so horrible that he referred to her in his review not as a singer, but as a perpetrator. A peccadillo is a minor offense, a petty little crime. Why, that's right, Dick. It makes one wonder why some people are more interested in an upstanding citizen's sexual peccadillos than in a lifetime of hard work, or why certain perpetrators believe that the heinous crimes they've committed are merely peccadillos when they're not. Hmm. Eating the last cookie from the cookie jar. Now that's a peccadillo, right? Right. But would you call cheating on your partner of several years and then lying about it a mere peccadillo? Judge not lest ye be judged. Very well, enough of peccadillos, then. Let's look at the next word. Culpable. Hmm, perhaps you should define this one. As you wish. A person who is culpable is deserving of blame or guilty. You may know the word culprit, which means the guilty one, and you'll see the connection between it and culpable. We all felt culpable when the brownies burned to a crisp while we were playing croquet. As you might imagine, exculpate means to find someone not culpable or innocent. I suggest you learn that one, too. The accountant's failure to spot the errors in my tax returns makes him as culpable as I am. But then again, it would be unfair of me to blame him for my being delinquent. That's a word you might be familiar with because of the oft-used term juvenile delinquent. But anybody can be delinquent at any time. And not only juveniles are juvenile, for that matter, but that's talk for another day. For now, delinquent means neglectful of the law or duty. It can also mean late in payment. The telephone company will turn off your phone if you're delinquent in paying your bill. Delinquent can also be a noun. A delinquent is someone who is delinquent. There is no verb, so don't worry. Let's move on to malfeasance. Malfeasance is any illegal act. It usually refers to a public official. 
Richard Nixon is perhaps the most notorious of those elected officials who have violated the public trust by engaging in acts of malfeasance. But he is by no means the only one. Malfeasance, by the way, doesn't specify the nature of the wrongdoing. On the contrary, malfeasance is preferred by politicians in trouble because it's so vague about what might have happened. It just means some basic naughtiness to be determined later. Not true of larceny, which again means crime, but more specifically theft or robbery. Strictly speaking, larceny is theft without breaking in, which, depending on your point of view, may be even worse. It seems doubly wicked to steal from someone who's already let you in. Larceny can range anywhere from stealing the cookies from the cookie jar to ripping off my Picasso original while I'm cooking for you in the kitchen. Let's move on to contraband, one of my favorite crime words. Contraband is what you call anything that is smuggled because it's illegal. Inevitably, it ends up being drugs, but contraband is not limited to any particular substance or product. Toenail clippers are contraband if they've been smuggled in against the law. Often, plants and food from other countries are contraband because the government is afraid that diseases can be carried in with them. The prefix contra is at the front end of this word, and it provides a simple way of remembering what it means. Contra means against, and anything contraband is against the law to import. Our final word for the crime half of the group, crime and punishment, will be that old standby interloper, which means an intruder, trespasser, or unwanted person. I don't care what you say, I view those legions of rats as interlopers in my bedroom. As much as we love watching Jacques Cousteau swim among the pretty fishes, at some level, he is an interloper in their realm. Interloper. Liz, what time is it? It's time for a quick quiz. Right you are. Let's start. Perpetrator. The one who did it. He or she who committed the act or crime. Peccadillo. A peccadillo is a minor offense, a petty little crime. Culpable. Culpable means deserving of blame or guilty. Delinquent. Neglectful of law or duty. Late. Malfeasance. Any illegal act generally associated with political figures. Larceny. Larceny is theft that's committed without breaking in. Contraband. Any illegal substance that is smuggled in. Interloper. An interloper is an intruder or trespasser. Now, who do you think might be that special someone who has first-hand experience with all the words we've been discussing? None other than our old friend, Customs Inspector Jackie. You would be amazed at the things people try to get away with when they're coming into the U.S. of A. As a Customs and Immigration Inspector, I have to make sure that no one slips in any contraband, such as fresh food from overseas. You see, agricultural products can harbor microscopic interlopers like outer Mongolian fruit flies, who would not be welcome on our pristine farms here in the States. And if I suspect that someone is trying to smuggle in drugs or ivory, I would be delinquent in my duties if I did not do a thorough body cavity search. Yeah, it's kind of gross, but someone's got to catch perpetrators of these more serious crimes. Luckily, I have the assistance of Sparky, my little beagle who's been trained to sniff out all the illegal stuff, and we've yet to mistake an innocent person for a culpable one. Those who are guilty of some malfeasance or other are handed over to the police. Some travelers think that lying about the value of all the tchotchkes and knickknacks they picked up on their trips is merely a peccadillo. But not paying duties on imports is a much bigger sin, akin to larceny. In effect, it's stealing money from our government and depriving everyone of the goods and services that those taxes pay for. Now that we've had a sense of how the crime words work in context, let's plow ahead and cover the punishment words. These are fun. Let's start with castigate. This one is especially close to my heart. When you castigate someone, you criticize them severely. It's really a verbal form of punishment. You jerk. How could you have done that? Are you so completely self-absorbed that you can't, even for a minute, consider that I might have some reaction, however small, to that sort of behavior? Exactly. That's castigation. I'm serious. Who was it who taught you that sort of thing is okay? Or is it that just 
you naturally equate love with pain. I mean, good grief! Does your mother like you? Great. That's another excellent example of castigation. You really are incredible. You know, you just... Next word. Liz. I mean, it seems to Next be... Next word. Castigate is over. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Next word. Allege. I'll take this one. To allege is to assert something without proof. That is, even though you are not certain, you go ahead and claim that someone has done something wrong, even though they might not have. That is what it means to allege. As in the alleged criminal. Exactly. Which means he is innocent until proven guilty. This is also where we get the word allegation, which is the noun form of the word. When you allege that someone has done something, that is, you've claimed it to be so but have not proven it, you've made an allegation. Okay, fine. Let's look at another word from the punishment group. Judicious. There's a word we can use. When you divide our meals up using a scale and you count the number of peas we each get to make sure that we're even, you're being nutty as a fruitcake. But at least you're being judicious. It means using good judgment, being thorough and fair. King Solomon was famous for being judicious. He could fairly resolve virtually any dispute. Be careful not to confuse judicious with judicial. It's clear that they both have something to do with judges, but only one makes a value judgment, so to speak. Right. Judicial refers to anything having to do with judges, justice, or judgment. Judicious, on the other hand, means specifically good, prudent, or sound judgment. To make judicious rulings, it helps to be disinterested. Often used incorrectly to mean not interested, disinterested really means unbiased or not taking sides. Don't confuse disinterested with uninterested. Referees, for instance, should be disinterested. They shouldn't root for either team. Parents have a hard time being disinterested because they want the best for their kids. Usually. Courtrooms are filled with people who are anything but disinterested regarding the case. Only one person is truly disinterested, the judge. Good justice depends on the judges not taking sides. Should you be found guilty of your crimes, you monster, then you'll surely be subject to censure. Not to be confused with censor, which means to edit objectionable material. To censure means to condemn or punish severely. The angry parent censured the idiot clown for pestering their child. Let's try it as a noun. The idiot clown, fearing censure, waddled towards the exit as fast as his flippy flappy shoes could carry him. When roaches eat my food, I censure them by slapping them. When it comes to idiot clowns as well as roaches, I tend to be censurious. I do a lot of censuring. For those who are inclined towards more merciful behavior, I give you absolve. People who are familiar with the workings of the Catholic Church are probably familiar with this word. The priest told the exterminator that if he said 37 Hail Marys for every roach he killed, he would be absolved of the sin of murder. You can also absolve someone of their responsibility. I absolve you of your responsibility to go to the film festival with me. I can see you would prefer to go with that diminutive foreign filmmaker, and I don't want to stand in your way. To absolve is to forgive or free someone from blame, sin, responsibility, or obligation. And furthermore, the act of absolving someone, which isn't always easy, is called absolution. That's a noun meaning forgiveness. The key to the word absolve is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't commit the crime. It simply means that the responsibility has been taken from you or that the price has been paid. In a similar vein, there is clemency, which really means mercy. More specifically, clemency is used when talking about the severity of a sentence. For example, the judge showed clemency in sentencing the arsonist to a mere week in jail. He was, after all, only seven years old. Clemency can be described as mildness or forgiveness as it applies to the way we treat each other. Inclement weather is weather that is not mild. Clement weather is weather that is easy to enjoy. After having discovered her fiancé in bed with a stranger, Jessie displayed tremendous clemency by only aiming at their feet rather than slightly higher. And finally, to cap off the punishment words, penitent is one that might help you find absolution. Liz was penitent when Dick explained how much pain she had caused him. 
To be penitent is to be sorry, repentant, or contrite. One way to elicit clemency from the judge is to appear penitent. If there's one thing that society hates, it's an unrepentant criminal. The girls tried to sound penitent at the police station, but they weren't really sorry that they stuck those women with a seven-inch hat pin. Yikes! Those girls were impenitent. Bill, surely you remember Bill, the latter, not the former Bill, was famous for both his womanizing and his lack of penitence. Having his way with lots of gals was, he believed, his birthright and he wasn't the least bit sorry. Good. That's that. Now a quick review of the words we just learned. Listen up. These are the definitions. Castigate. To sharply criticize. To punish severely using words. Allege. To allege is to accuse someone of a crime but not to prove it. To make an allegation. Judicious. When someone is judicious, they are thorough and fair in coming to a decision. Disinterested. Disinterested simply describes someone who is impartial or unbiased. Censure. This is both a verb and a noun, and it means to punish, or the punishment itself. Absolve. To absolve is to free someone of blame or responsibility. Clemency. Clemency is mildness or gentleness with regard to punishment. And, of course, penitent. When you're penitent, you're sorry for what you did. Now, journey back with us, won't you, to those heady, happy days of the beloved Inquisition, when people really knew their place. To give us a sense of what those halcyon times were really like, let's meet Don, a junior, if not ambitious, member of one particularly fervent group of inquisitors, who will use these punishment words in context. Don? Thanks, Dick. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by saying that a lot of our group's admittedly horrendous reputation is really undeserved. While most people believe that our basic M.O. is physical torture, Really, we generally stick to verbal castigation and exile as a means of punishment. Often, just telling someone that they committed treasonous and heretical acts is sufficient censure. It's usually all the punishment they need to get them to stop. Of course, if a particular defendant does not display a reasonably penitent attitude, then we might consider pulling their bodies apart on the rack or breaking their thumbs in the press. But look, either you say you're sorry or you face the consequences. I think, though, that people don't appreciate just how judicious we really are. I mean, our work is really thorough, and I think it's safe to say, for the most part, fair. Alleged non-believers are always considered innocent until we decide they are not. We remain disinterested until one of the group convinces us that the heretic is deserving of punishment, or, on the other hand, occasionally, clemency. But we all know that tough love is more effective than mercy. Now... I'm willing to concede that the ratio of those whom we hold accountable to those whom we absolve is a little top-heavy. But that's just a natural reflection of the population itself. They mostly deserve to die. Delightful. Now let's cover all the words in crime and punishment one last time. You'll hear a word and then a brief pause during which you can decide whether it's a part of the crime half or the punishment half of the group. Following that, you'll hear a quote from the speech either by Customs Inspector Jackie or Don the Inquisitor, which contains that word. Then we'll define the word and supply you with yet one more example sentence. That's how it will go, so get ready. Let the review begin. First up, culpable. We've yet to mistake an innocent person for a culpable one. Culpable means worthy of blame, the guilty one. After following a trail of little brown droppings, we learned that the mouse was culpable in the case of the missing cheese. Allege. Alleged non-believers are always considered innocent until we decide they aren't. To allege is to accuse without proof. Jane alleged that her professor had made advances towards her, but without physical evidence, the board was unwilling to believe her. Contraband. As a customs and immigration inspector, I have to make sure no one slips in any contraband, such as fresh food from overseas. Contraband is any material that is smuggled. Cigarettes are contraband in Jiminy's house. His parents have forbidden them, so he has to smuggle them in. Interloper You see, agricultural products can harbor microscopic interlopers like outer Mongolian fruit flies. An interloper is an unwanted trespasser or invader. 
After selling 40 million copies of his album, the singer erected electric fences around his home to keep out interlopers. Judicious. I think, though, that people don't appreciate just how judicious we really are. I mean, our work is really thorough, and I think it's safe to say, for the most part, fair. When someone is judicious, they are thorough and fair in coming to a decision. Arnie's new movie could really benefit from some judicious editing. It would be better if it were half as long. Censure Often just telling someone that they committed treasonous and heretical acts is sufficient censure. It's usually all the punishment they need to get them to stop. To censure someone is to punish them. After he put the tarantula in little Julian's bed, Richard was censured by his father. He was forced to learn how to play the harp. Peccadillo Some travelers think that lying about the value of their tchotchkes and knickknacks they picked up on their trips is merely a peccadillo. A peccadillo is an insignificant or petty little crime. Pinching an extra olive from the bartender's bottle is a peccadillo. Setting the bar on fire is not. Disinterested. We remain disinterested until one of the group convinces us that the heretic is deserving of punishment. Disinterested means impartial and unbiased. You can't ask mom to decide who's wrong because she's not disinterested. She loves you more than me. Malfeasance. Those who are guilty of some malfeasance or other are handed over to the police. Malfeasance means any illegal act. Senator Cumanseed has been found guilty on several counts of malfeasance, and therefore he needs to resign. Clemency We remain disinterested until one of the group convinces us that the heretic is deserving of punishment, or, on the other hand, occasionally, clemency. But we all know that tough love is more effective than mercy. Clemency is mildness or gentleness with regard to punishment. Because it was Jeremiah's first offense, the judge showed clemency and sentenced him to only 17 hours in prison. Castigate While most people believe that our basic M.O. is physical torture, really, we generally stick to verbal castigation and exile as a means of punishment. To castigate is to criticize someone severely. The director of the school orchestra castigated Lisa, telling her that improvisation has no place in a chamber music ensemble. Delinquent And if I suspect that someone is trying to smuggle in drugs or ivory, I would be delinquent in my duties if I did not do a thorough body cavity search. When someone is delinquent, they are neglectful of the law or duty, or overdue. The author was typically delinquent, so his editor eventually got smart and gave him false deadlines, which were weeks ahead of when she really needed them. Absolve now, I'm willing to concede that the ratio of those whom we hold accountable to those whom we absolve is a little top-heavy, but that is just a natural reflection of the population itself. To absolve is to free someone of blame or responsibility. After she realized that the disaster was not Ross's fault but the director's, Sally absolved poor Ross of the blame. Larceny But not paying duties on imports is a much bigger sin akin to larceny. Larceny is theft or robbery that is committed without breaking in. Stealing the painkillers out of Grandpa's medicine cabinet is an act of larceny. Perpetrator Yeah, it's kind of gross, but someone's got to catch the perpetrators of these more serious crimes. The perpetrator is the one who committed the act, whatever it is, although it usually connotes a crime. It took us only a matter of hours before we discovered that Joni was the perpetrator. It was she who used blackmail to force the others to quit. And, always last but never least, penitent. Of course, if a particular defendant doesn't display a reasonably penitent attitude, then we might consider pulling their bodies apart on the rack or breaking their thumbs in the press. When you're penitent, you're sorry for what you did. If you loved me, you'd show your penitence for cheating on me by giving me that sweet little bauble I was admiring at Tiffany's. Nice ending. Terrific way to finish, Liz.